Welcome to Psydactic, Residency Edition, your podcast resource to survive and thrive in your psych residency. I am Dr. O, and as of this recording, I am a second-year resident in the National Capital Consortium Psychiatry Residency Program. However, make no mistake, I do not speak for this program, nor do I speak for the Department of Defense or the federal government or anyone else for that matter. What I say is my opinion, and I reserve the right to be wrong. So trust me, at your own risk. References and recommended readings can be found at the end of the show transcript located at sidactic.buzzsprout.com. Before I get started here, I want to take another chance to turn you on to another resource out there for psych residents and med students. It's called Bullet Psych, located at www.bulletpsych.com, and it gives you the option of signing up for a free daily email stream of content in bite-sized chunks to learn about psychiatric disorders. It's created by a fellow residency colleague of mine, Dr. Marcus Hunt. And for those of you like me who tend to fall asleep after reading about three paragraphs, it may be just the thing for you. It's concise, well-organized, and somehow still manages to give you a good, thorough treatment of its subject. So try Googling bullet psych and see where it takes you. By the way, Dr. Hunt is not paying for me to say this. I do it of my own free will and admiration. Today I want to talk to you about a diagnosis that is not technically a diagnosis. By that I mean that it is a condition that we might find our patients in, but it's not considered to be a diagnosis by itself, like major depressive disorder or schizophrenia are considered to be diagnoses. I'm talking about catatonia, a condition characterized by either a lack of interaction with the world or purposeless interaction with the world. It has been called Kohlbaum syndrome after its first describer, German psychiatrist Karl Ludwig Kohlbaum. It appears that Kalbaum conceptualized catatonia as its own entity, but since then, many others have disagreed. One was Emil Wilhelm Georg Magnus Kraepelin, another German psychiatrist, racist, and eugenicist, who argued that catatonia was simply a manifestation of schizophrenia, or dementia precox, as he called it. Since this time... Catatonia has been found to be more common in mood disorders than in schizophrenia and can be seen in some sense as an acute and potentially chronic brain failure with its own distinct features. You'll find the diagnostic criteria for catatonia in the schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders chapter in the DSM-5, which seems to represent more of an historical nod to Kraepelin than to careful categorization. In the DSM, this condition continues to be considered a specifier for other conditions, such as schizophrenia or mood disorders, or it can be diagnosed as secondary to a medical condition, If you don't know what caused catatonia, you can label it unspecified catatonia. But other than that unspecified designation, you can't simply diagnose a patient with catatonia. You have to figure out what is causing the catatonia and diagnose that. This is important because although catatonia has its own treatment course and prognosis, if you don't treat the underlying condition that resulted in the catatonia, you haven't fully treated the catatonia. But what, Dr. O, you might ask, is this catatonia? The DSM-5 states you have to have three features from a list of 12 diagnostic signs to be diagnosed with catatonia. From what I've read, it seems that using the cutoff of three features is both highly specific and sensitive, but there's no real gold standard to compare it to. Unlike many diagnoses in the DSM, none of the features of catatonia are subjective symptoms, those symptoms that the patient would just tell you that they feel. They are signs that you should be able to identify in the patient. 
So for the sake of time in this episode, I'm going to list the signs, and then I'm going to give brief descriptions. But in later episodes, I will explore the pathophysiology and particular definitions of these signs in a lot more detail. The 12 signs of catatonia in the DSM-5 are these. Stupor. Catalepsy. Waxy flexibility. Mutism. Negativism. Posturing. Mannerism. Stereotypy. Agitation. Grimacing. Echolalia. Echopraxia. I'm going to go back through those now with brief descriptions. Number one, stupor. Stupor is loosely defined as showing really no sign of interacting with the world around the patient, which might manifest as the patient really not leaving their bed or their chair to defecate, not eating their food, not responding to requests. But it's different than other reasons patients might not uh, interact with the world, such as when they're heavily sedated, asleep, they have locked-in syndrome, or they're in a coma. Two, catalepsy. Catalepsy is when a patient maintains a pose that requires at least some part of their body to be held against gravity. And this is distinguished from what I'm going to talk about later, posturing, which is basically the same phenomenon, except that in catalepsy, the examiner has placed the patient in a posture, and the patient maintains that posture. But in posturing, the patient has placed themselves in that posture. Three, waxy flexibility. This is the ability of the examiner to move parts of the patient's body while experiencing even resistance that is easily overcome by the examiner. It's important that the force is even and not intermittent, like cogwheeling caused by tremor-like activity in Parkinsonism. The even force is what waxy means in waxy flexibility. Four. Mutism. The patient makes no effort at verbal communication and was previously able to. So it's important to note that mutism doesn't count if they're not a conscious or if they're in a comatose type state. Five. Negativism. This is a tough one for me to understand. The, the DSM defines it as opposition to or no response to instructions or external stimuli, but how this is different from stupor exactly, I'm not sure yet. I also uh, have seen it described differently as automatic and motiveless resistance to instructions. So I'll have to get back to this one. It'll be a topic for a future episode. Six. Posturing. So I already talked about catalepsy and compared it to posturing. So posturing is the maintenance of a position of some part of the body uh, against gravity. But instead of it being put there by the examiner, it was put there by the patient themselves. Seven. Mannerism. The DSM describes mannerism as odd circumstantial caricatures of normal actions. So I get the feeling that this particular sign is highly subjective to the examiner's interpretation of what seems odd and circumstantial. Maybe the patient automatically waves hello with an exaggerated wave of their hand when anyone enters the room. Or maybe a soldier automatically salutes anyone walking by regardless of who they are. Eight. Stereotypy. Stereotypy is, are also actions, like mannerisms, but they're purposeless as opposed to having maybe some purpose in a mannerism. Um, stereotypy can also be oddly frequent or repetitive, like when a patient seems to be perseverating. Nine. Agitation. I really have a grudge against the word agitation because 
it is so vague and so frequently thrown around by medical professionals that it's almost meaningless. However, the DSM specifies that agitation in catatonia must be entirely internally motivated and not due to their environment. They're not angry at something you're doing to them. It's something that came up inside them. They can't be angry at like being woke up for a blood draw or trying to leave the hospital to go home. Their agitation needs to appear unprovoked and purposeless to the examiner for it to be catatonic agitation. 10. Grimacing. Grimacing is holding a facial expression for longer than someone would normally do it, and also for really no apparent reason. Think of it as facial posturing. 11. Echolalia. This is when a patient repeats back in an automatic fashion words or phrases or the ends of words that were just or very recently spoken to them. This is similar to 12. Echopraxia. Echopraxia is when a patient seems to automatically mimic something the examiner just did instead of something the examiner just said. Um, and it's not the same thing as what happens in a theater when someone coughs and then everyone else coughs, though it might be related. Uh, or like when you see someone else take a drink and then suddenly you feel the urge to take a drink yourself. Those things might be related, but for echopraxia to be echopraxia and catatonia, it really needs to be more odd than that. For example, you scratch your head and then the patient scratches their head. So there you have it, the 12 disciples of catatonia. Some of these seem very related, like echolalia and echopraxia, or catalepsy posturing and grimacing, or stupor and mutism, or mannerisms and stereotypy. However, it does not matter which of the three you find. If you find three, it's catatonia. I want to reiterate here that I'm not going into a deep discussion of these signs right here. I will do that in the future when I talk about the causes of catatonia. For now, I'm going to go into what you need to do when you see these things. So first, you need to make sure you're not confusing catatonia with something else like delirium. Second, you need to immediately treat the catatonia. And third, you need to treat the underlying cause. So let's get started. First, don't confuse catatonia with something else. Catatonia comes in a few different flavors. In the English literature, it's most often distinguished by two presentations. One is called retarded, the other excited. But I've also seen it called akinetic and hyperkinetic. Retarded or akinetic presentations are predominated by the signs that lack movement or responses, such as stupor, catalepsy, mutism, and negativism. Excited or hyperkinetic catatonia is defined by the movement unrestricted signs, such as agitation, stereotypy, and mannerisms. By far the most commonly reported presentation of catatonia is the retarded or akinetic type. What is most worrisome about catatonia is the potential for it to progress to malignant catatonia, which is very similar to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. There is a pathological increase in muscle tone leading to rhabdomyolysis, kidney failure, seizures, arrhythmias, and death. There are a number of other psychiatric disorders you don't want to confuse with catatonia. I I think the most obvious culprit is delirium, which also comes in two distinct varieties, which are termed hyperactive and hypoactive. However, in delirium, patients often have perceptual disturbances, or they have highly variable levels of orientation to their surroundings, and the lack of the ability to maintain their attention. This condition is quite often associated with procedural sedation, or metabolic abnormalities, or toxic ingestions, infections, or systemic inflammation. Delirious patients may be seen to be staring forward, but you can redirect their gaze. They may be agitated, but unlike in catatonia, they 
can articulate a purpose, or at least what they perceive as their purpose. Like, they want the staff to leave them alone, or they want uh, to leave the hospital, or they're hallucinating words written all over the walls of their room, and it's disturbing. Delirious patients may also be minimally interactive, but this changes throughout the day and is not associated with an increase in muscle tone or with posturing. Also, patients with delirium often show diffuse slowing on EEG. Catatonic patients might also have diffuse slowing on EEG, but their EEGs are frequently normal. So in this case, EEG probably is not a good tiebreaker, and you need to look more at the clinical picture. There are some conditions in which patients are minimally interactive or mute. Abulia is another condition in which a patient is fully aware of their surroundings and has no real cognitive or motor disturbances, but is just apathetic and unmotivated. In its extreme form, apathy can result in a condition called akinetic mutism. These patients also won't have any of the tonia that catatonic patients have, nor will they demonstrate the unrestrained motor activity of excited catatonic patients. If you are unsure if your patient is catatonic or experiencing akinetic mutism, you can do an Ativan challenge and just see if a little lorazepam improves their condition. If it does, it's more likely catatonia. Other things not to be confused with catatonia are extrapyramidal symptoms secondary to antipsychotic use. Antipsychotics can cause an increase in muscle tone and abnormal movements due to their effects on the striatum. They can also contribute to or mimic negative symptoms of schizophrenia. What is great about EPS and catatonia is that if you're not sure which it is, that really doesn't make a huge difference in how you would treat it. If you are not sure whether they have EPS or catatonia, you should stop antipsychotics and give some lorazepam. Because this is helpful in both conditions and can help prevent progression to neuroleptic malignant syndrome or malignant catatonia. Other conditions that might mimic catatonia include certain forms of epilepsy, locked-in syndrome, or even a vegetative state. A good patient history along with an EEG or an MRI might help distinguish these etiologies, which may also resemble akinetic or retarded catatonia. After ruling out other conditions that look similar to catatonia, you can treat. It's important not to give antipsychotics to patients with catatonia, even if they have schizophrenia, because it predisposes them to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Instead, give benzos. Give one milligram of Ativan, and if that doesn't work, give two milligrams of Ativan, and if that doesn't work, give three or four milligrams of Ativan, and if that doesn't work, just give more Ativan. Small and old patients may need less Ativan to start. And if you start with a very low dose, then it's reasonable to give another dose after about 30 minutes if there's no response. But if your dose is higher than, say, one milligram, then you probably want to wait about three hours and then dose again. Around 80 to 90 percent of patients with catatonia have a good response to lorazepam, which is seen as a return to their relatively normal motor functioning. The akinetic or retarded patient will become interactive, and the hyperkinetic or excited patient will calm down. For some reason, though, only about 50 to 60 percent of schizophrenic patients with catatonia will have such robust response, which points to potentially different mechanisms in schizophrenia. You can treat catatonia empirically, even if you're not sure it's actually catatonia, because the treatment is unlikely to harm the patient, at least the first line. Though giving benzos to a patient with delirium may result in disinhibition. If lorazepam doesn't work and ECT is available, 
give them ECT. And don't wait too long. This is also highly effective for malignant catatonia, and if they have malignant catatonia, you should not hesitate to give ECT as soon as possible. Give them benzos and start ECT. There are a number of other much less effective treatment options. For some patients, an excess of glutamatergic tone may be contributing to catatonia, so trying glutamate blocking agents like memantine or amantadine is reasonable. Instead of increasing inhibitory tone in the brain, which is what GABA does, these drugs would decrease the excitatory tone, which is what glutamate does. It's unclear how effective they actually are, but in patients where catatonia is caused by an NMDA encephalitis, it's reasonable to target the NMDA receptor itself. Other drugs that potentiate GABA, such as the Z drugs like Zolpidem, are also reasonable choices and could be used in the maintenance phase of treatment, which may be necessary to prevent relapse into catatonia. The final thing I want to leave you with in this episode is treat the underlying cause. Catatonia is a movement disorder which is most often the result of some other lying disorder. Catatonia is more common in mood disorders than in psychotic disorders. Treating the underlying depression or bipolar or psychosis is key. One of the difficulties that can arise is that patients with catatonia should not be on antipsychotics, especially those with moderate to high potential for EPS, because this results in higher rates of progression to NMS or malignant catatonia. Various other neurological and medical disorders can also result in catatonia, including some strokes, autoimmune disorders like NMDA encephalitis, and CNS infections. If you don't treat these conditions, the catatonia is unlikely to improve, and patients are more likely to relapse. I have wanted to talk about catatonia for a long time. In future episodes, I will go into more excruciating detail about the proposed neurobiology and pathophysiology of catatonia, as well as how to clearly understand and identify the signs of catatonia, how to distinguish them from other things that look very similar. Once you learn about catatonia, you'll start to see signs of it everywhere, and it's important to know whether this is a true sign or a mimic. I am Dr. Rowe, and this has been an episode of Sidactic Residency Edition. <laughs>